everyone out there. Um, it's a little different today since I don't see everybody joining on the webinar, but anyway, um, this is the third session of the Gray Area Expanded Cinema Book Club. We are, this is April 19th, uh, year of our Lord 2020, um, and we are excited today to be covering uh, part two of Expanded Cinema on Synesthetic Cinema um, with, once again, Gene Youngblood, and today we are thrilled to invite for our uh, guest interlocutor, Amelia Winger Bearskin. Um, she's an artist technologist who helps communities leverage emerging technologies to affect positive change in the world and has done a host of um, fascinating projects uh, in virtual reality and community building and placemaking. Um, and more that I'm sure we'll talk about, including being a professor at uh, NYU's ITP program, um, or graduated uh, graduated from ITP, uh, professor at Vanderbilt. Um, so like every week, uh, I think we're gonna start out by um, covering, uh, uh, revisiting some of the things that we said in last week's session. Um, so, Gene, would you like to start out? And yeah, I that. think so. Great. Well, that, let me see where my notes are. Uh, sure. Okay. One second. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I just need to minimize this thing. Okay. Um, yeah, I... Uh, I told, uh, I guess everybody, that I, I sort of didn't want to talk about this chapter. Um, however. Yeah, if, here we are. Uh, yeah, Amelia or anybody, if, if you do, I'm up for it. I, it's just, I have to say, okay, there's a, in the introduction, there's a scene with Heinz von Forster. He invites me up to Pescadero to have a two-day talk with Humberto Maturana. And uh, so we get there, it's starting. And he says, oh, Gene, may I sit in on this fascinating conversation? And I say, but Heinz, you know, you know all this stuff, you'll just be bored. And he says, I won't be bored because I'm not boring. Well, uh, and, I, and in there I say, I'll, I never forgot that. Well, I sort of forgot it until this morning. Uh, I, must, I must admit, I'm bored with this book. And you know, uh, last, uh, the last time, uh, uh, last Sunday, Michael was saying, oh, you, you told us that you hadn't opened a book in 20 years. And I thought I saw a little amusement in his uh, expression. Well, you know, I wrote the thing half a century ago. Why would I be interested in it now? So anyway, um, uh, so I want to, so what Heinz meant when he said, I won't be bored because I'm not boring, whenever he found himself bored, he just changed the subject entirely. And that's what I'm gonna do right now. And fortunately, Barry, you've done an inspired thing putting me together with this woman here because I, we're on a very, very similar tracks. And thank you very much for doing this. This is terrific. There are very few people in the world I could talk about this stuff with. So, uh, we're changing the subject to this brilliant person. And uh, that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, I guess nobody, <laughs> is nobody listening? Nobody's online yet? No, they are. It's just, um, we've sort of switched the technology towards this webinar thing. And so you just can't see their faces on the grid, but we have, um, 35 people or something there. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Okay. I, I just a couple of things. Um, last time we talked about my wise friend, Ted Zatlin, and we were talking about counterculture and uh, wh what he, how he talked about it. We were talking about naivete. Were we, were we naive? And he said, no, it was a celebration of innocence. And we talked about that. You all re will remember. And we, we trashed the idea of na naivete, uh, Bucky saying, uh, dare to be naive. Well, after that, 
uh, you know, I've known Ted since 1966. And I, I, I remember I said, Ted, you once called us, i.e. the counterculture, desperados. What did you mean by that? And he told me what he meant, <laughs> but it's just too long to go into now. Uh, it's just a whole ph philosophical thing. But I asked him, how do you reconcile the notion of celebrating innocence and also be desperados at the same time? Uh, maybe I shouldn't even have brought this up because I can't go in it, into it, uh, but I'm going to be writing these things. I, you know, I, what I'm writing is about that, so it'll come out at some point. Another thing that happened, um, and this is more about me, um, we're talking with uh, Michael and about social media. And I was saying I never do social media, I never will do social media. And uh, why, why do they do it? And he said, well, that, I don't know the, the actual words, but it's the only way we can stay in touch with our community. Well, yeah. Um, I don't know what community means. I mean, there are many, many, many ways to interpret that word. I, I never had a community. You might say, wait a minute, what about the, uh, the counterculture? What about the 60s? Well, I never felt I had a community with them. And if we could, if we could play a certain video I have, remember uh, in Rhizome, um, they played a video of uh, Greg Palast uh, talking about my writing and how I'm supposed to be like uh, uh, Hunter Thompson and all that stuff. Well, in that same documentary, I trashed the, uh, the counterculture in an article that I wrote right in the center of counterculture. It was really insulting to them uh, and for, for reasons we can't go into now. Just, just saying that this notion of community, who's a community, what is a community? You go on with 100 million people, you think you're talking to a community? I mean, I just don't, I mean, I would never do such a thing, never expose myself to the people who have been socialized by this culture that way. So, you know, I, you might say, well, this is just a generation gap. I'm not so sure about that. There's something called critical thinking. You know, there's something called alienation. There are a lot of reasons why one would not want to do certain things like that and call it community. Okay, the last two things. Uh, uh, I, uh, I mentioned this guy, Brian Konevsky, who spent a year doing a documentary on me that didn't come out, but it is not coming out because he's, he's done enough to teach anymore. Um, but I didn't mention, I failed to mention that he runs a uh, experimental film festival here in, uh, in Albuquerque uh, called Experiments in Cinema. It's one of the best ones in the country. As you probably know, um, you probably know that uh, many, many uh, of these experimental film festivals are just popping up all over the place. His is one of the best. And so I just, you know, forgot to say that. It's important to acknowledge who this man was. And then finally, in that documentary of Rhizome, there was a, you saw a German guy talking about me and he, he was not identified. Uh, that's because Michael had to re-edit the doc in a certain way that uh, he just had to and he did a brilliant job at it. So I just want to identify that guy. It's Peter Weibel, who is the founding director of ZKM in uh, Karlsruhe, Germany, one of the leading uh, media arts, uh, I don't want to say museum. Uh, centers. Huh? Centers. Centers, media arts centers in the world. And so I just want to get that in there. No, you know, he was not identified. So that's that. That's just the business that I uh, wanted to take care of. Yeah, and uh, people haven't seen the uh, Expanded Cinema 50th Anniversary book launch uh, video with Rhizome. Um, I think the link for that is on our websites at Gray Area, and it's really worth watching if you haven't. Um, there's some good information in there. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and Amelia, I suppose. Hi, Amelia. Hi, Gene. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you for being here. I can't tell you how thrilled I am uh, because I read, may I, may I uh, say what I would like to do? Go for it. Okay. You've got this amazing article, this wonderful article that I went through 
my wife Jane went through it with me and we highlighted a lot of stuff. And I was just astounded at how close we are in our interests and also how different we are in our takes on these things. And it occurred to me that the way to do this, if you don't mind, is I would like to just go through your article with you. And it would do two things. It would identify who you are really well, and it would give us a chance to, uh, to mark the uh, similarities and differences to our approach to this extremely important subject that we're both dedicated to. So I would just love to do it that way, if you don't mind. That's awesome. That sounds great. I'm going to post the link for everyone if they want to follow along in the chat here. So. Okay. And then, um, there was, you know, uh, hold, one second. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, there was, I said I didn't want to talk about the book, but there is one thing that I did, and I'm trying to, what did I do here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this chapter that we're reading starts out with uh, me talking about uh, the new narrative things, uh, the experimental cinema that was emerging at the time. And I say something, at, I start talking at the top about genres. And I trash genres. And, and uh, it was, it's like, I was, I was almost sounding like, oh my God, I'm shocked, shocked that there's genre filmmaking going on here. <coughs> and then I say, my God, Alfred Hitchcock actually admitted up front that he manipulates people with his genres. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, hey, <laughs> that's one of the things about this book that, you know, I was such a kid. What did I know? Uh, genres are incredibly important, as Amelia points out in her beautiful article. The problem is, or, or the point is, wait, for, well, why are genres important? They're a, they're a fundamental uh, dimension of the social glue. You know, they've got to be there. The important thing is the absence of critical thinking. You've got to be aware every minute that this is a genre. It has rules. It has ways, modes, forms. And you've got to be aware of that every second. If, and I don't care how important they are to your life. Otherwise, you're not thinking critically. You've got to step outside of any narrative, I don't care what it is, and think critically about it. Think about thinking. So that's what I was, the, I just wasn't articulate enough at, that, at 26 years old. I just couldn't say it that way. Look behind me. Well, you can't see right now, but before you have, I've got about close to a thousand movies behind me here, and they're all narrative genre films from every country around the world. I uh, uh, retired from teaching 13 years ago. And during that time, I became, I believe me, an expert on that very thing that I'm not known for, the genre Hollywood film. And so I just want to make that very, very important point that I was unable to make 50 years ago in expanded cinema. Genres are the social glue. You, you break them and you break the society. But be but know what you're doing. All these films behind me here, only a tiny, tiny fraction of them are what I would call art. I mean, serious art. And I know which ones they are and I know what I'm doing when I look at them, you know. Uh, I love Hitchcock, but he is not serious art. You know, Bresson, Ozu, Dreyer, you know, you get them some serious art and it's instantly obvious what is and what is not that. And one of the, um, one of the uh, imperatives of social control is that that particular distinction must not be apparent to most people. Again, it's this notion of social control depends on people not thinking critically in mass. And so I just wanted to, you know, that, that leaped out of me when I read that part of the book. Uh, and I just wanted to make those points, so I made them. <laughs> and is there anything else that anyone wants to 
found in that chapter and wants to bring up. It's not like I, uh, not, not like I'm want to prevent it. I, I really liked that you brought up Dog Star Man, which is, of course, I, I'm such a, I love that film, and I love thinking about that film, especially now when I'm, you know, sheltering in place and whatnot. I feel like that film has so much space in it. Um, it's interior space, but it has so much space. Um, and I liked that in that section you stated that there are no secrets in the paleo cybernetic age, and I, I wanted to. Take <laughs> <laughs> about what you thought about that is that uh, uh, Amelia. Amelia, wait. Your your voice is dropping out. I'm not quite as sure uh, sure what you said. You said something about Stan Brackage. Yeah, Dog Star Man. It's great. Oh, Dog Star. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and and you wanted to ask what about it? Um. Well, I really liked how much space it has. You know, just thinking about it being sheltered in space here. You know, in San Francisco, and you know, spending a lot of time in my apartment. I I loved just reading that article and, and remembering all my memories of watching Dog Star Man. I used to teach that in my video art class and show it, you know, every semester and it's been a while since I saw it. So I loved, you know, thinking about that again. Um, I also really liked the statement that you had in that chapter around Hopi Indians and the uh, present tense in their language that they called the past, the present manifested and the future present manifesting. And I can relate to that because I'm, I'm a Seneca Cayuga uh, nation of Oklahoma and we're part of the Iroquois Confederacy or Haudenosaunee and our language, our Seneca language is a verb based language. So we too have a different way of understanding tenses. So even like the word for tree or for human, we wouldn't say like, a human as a noun, but it's a human being. Like you're in, always in the state of being. And so it is a present tense language, but it's also everything is in a state of manifesting or being. Um, even a tree would be described by what it does, which is growing and living and being, right? So it's it, all nouns are verb-based, which is uh, just a different way of thinking. And I liked, um, I liked that you brought that into this chapter because I really resonate with that um, from my uh, native language. Thank you so much. That's, I had forgot I did that. Um, yeah, and let me just gloss on that a little bit. I, I, you know, what you just said is very profound. I mean, language is, I, my, one of the things I say all the time is, words don't express what we think, they tell us what we think, okay? So we all know that, but nobody takes it very seriously. Anyway, um, a couple things about brackage. As we speak, there's a uh, listserv that I belong to, uh, devoted to experimental cinema. It's called Frameworks. And everybody being like we are now, they are uh, starting a major uh, history or major life study of everything Bragg has ever did. It's probably going to be a thousand pages. Also, I'm, I, you probably know that Criterion Company uh, is has got a huge uh, Brackage uh, uh, a box set, of, including Dog Star Man. Uh, the, and Jane and I are have been for 13 years working on the video diaries of George Kuchar and making the point that we think that he is, for the first time in the world, anybody, showing how to do, uh, how to put subjectivity into uh, continuity filmmaking. That's very technical and I don't expect people to understand what I'm talking about, but notice one thing, uh, cinema does not have tenses. Pictures don't have tenses. If you want to put tense in a movie, you've got to do it by things that are external to the image. The uh, image is neither past nor present and, and unless you put stuff around it that tells you, you know, we call that punctuation. Lang language, whether it's Native American or anything, you don't have to do that, right? Words have tenses. Anyway, that's a very important contribution that we think we're making. And, uh, and that's an excellent point that you brought up. I really appreciate that. So, <laughs> can, I, can I launch upon my questions to you? Go for it. Okay, great. Let me uh, put this down. One second, see if I forgot anything here. Yeah. So, uh, Amelia, I just want to tell you, my life's mission, if uh, my life's interest is concluding now. I'm writing a book that I hope to conclude these ideas. It's called Secession from the Broadcast, Leave the Culture 
without leaving the country. And so I'll, I'll be talking about that as, as we go along because you, what you write is very close, but then not so close to that. So that'll be interesting. Okay, so, oh, let me see. Yeah, what I've done, folks, everybody listening, she's got this great article. Jane helped me highlight certain, a lot of stuff in here. So I'm just gonna go down the article and ask you about it, make comments and, uh, and, uh, and so what I'm, What's the title? Huh? What's the title of the article? She has, <laughs> don't ask. Uh, tell me the title of the article. It's before everyone was talking about decentralization. Decentralization was talking about everyone. Or yeah, talking okay. To everyone, talking to everyone. Yeah, yeah. The decentralization is a central idea to all of this. Uh, and I, I, I know that I'm probably going to get to this while we're, we're trolling down the, uh, down the text, but I, here it is in front of me, so I'm going to just say it anyway. She, uh, Amelia, you talk about a mind space, and uh, that's a beautiful open open concept uh i have a, a line from my my book about i say that for the first 30 years of my life everything was media just media my whole life i won't go into that now but it starts with me as a little kid listening to radio and in the, this is 1946 or 7. uh wait a minute no it's during World War II. So I'm like four years old or something. And those old radios used to have something called a tuning eye. It's this phosphorescent green eye, this glass thing. And, and it has a thing that looks like a keyhole. And if you tune to the signal properly, that the, the tail, if you will, of the keyhole gets narrower and that tells you that you're, you're on the signal. And it's, it's beautiful, cool, phosphorescent green. And little four-year-old me, I, I, did, I had to put my eye up, right up to it, so there was nothing else in the world but that, that, that eye. And you heard a man saying, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea, let's go to press. That was a guy named Walter Winchell, who was an extremely powerful uh, uh, gossip columnist. He could destroy lives. He did. Uh, black singer uh, right I'll remember later um, and so that that was a mind space you know, not only did you hear that guy you heard all the stories you know all the adventures on, on those old radio and so I got a line in my uh, work here that Amelia brought to mind so I tell that story about radio and then I say later we saw on television what we heard on radio, except the images. So mind space is unbelievably important. We all know that this is not big news, but that's the way I was saying it. And so I just wanted to show off. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna, okay. Before everyone was talking about decentralization, decentralization is talking to, talking to everyone. And I, I encourage everybody to read this. It's fabulous. And you start out uh, by talking about Minecraft. And uh, this is stuff I know nothing about. So, <clears throat> um, And uh, you talk about these 130 million other users. That's what I call the broadcast, mass culture, centralized mass culture. And it has certain values, capitalist industrial values. And so I just want to, I, I really resonate with that and with your attitude about that. Um, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, this is this question of what is a community? When I went on Rhizome uh, earlier with Michael and, and there were all these people asking questions, that's the first time in my life that I was ever on a, a uh, large audience thing like that. Who knows how many people were on that? And the most wacko questions came out of it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, you know, like the artist Nam June Paik was supposed to be like some kind of revolutionary. I, I thought to myself, who the hell am I talking to here? And I realized how important, how deeply important it is to me to know who I'm talking to. 
and that we are talking because we share something we share understandings and agreements about the world that are fundamentally important. And so here, right here at the top of your uh, thing, 130 million other people, and you say, you say there are 1.8 billion gamers around the world who are probably okay with that. I like that, <laughs> your tone. Um, and then you say, uh, and you talk about these new formats of community, I guess that's the way to say it, these no, new formats are popular because they meet a deep psychological need, the basic human drive to interact with other people through stories. Decentralized storytelling is what you, you get into here. And uh, I have a, a phrase uh, that I've been using for close to 50 years about how to talk about a communication revolution and I call it the decentralization and pluralization of, a, of a, the social construction of reality. The decentralization and pluralization of the social construction of reality. Everybody on this, in, on this reading has heard me say that 20 times. <clears throat> and the result of that is what I call building autonomous reality communities. And that comes from this, uh, that comes from Umberto Maturana we can talk about things because we create the things we talk about by talking about them. That's called autonomy, the basic, most important autonomy there is. Um, so I just, you know, thank you for letting me bounce off you that way and, and uh, give me a great way to say that. I'm, I'm getting to a point here where I'm gonna ask you, I'll let you talk. <laughs> I just- I'm, I'm, I'm so, happy to listen too. I really like what you're saying. <laughs> I'm just so excited about this article and I just want everybody to read it. It's really cool. Um, and you say, okay, may I offer, this is not a criticism, uh, just a suggestion as a writer. Um, <clears throat> to those of us schooled in 20th century forms of storytelling, writing, film, radio, television, may I just suggest that uh, those are modes, not forms. Forms apply to the content of those modes. So stories have forms. Media has modes. So one mode of communication is writing, film, all that. So anyway. Um, uh, and then you said this interesting, now, now understand this. I'm trying to say the same thing. I'm trying to talk about the same stuff you are. And, uh, and you made me think about stuff I never thought of before. Uh, how to build autonomous reality communities. What does that take? And why are we, for me, why do this? Uh, for radical resocialization. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to mention about uh, in, the, uh, in the introduction about stuff in the past that I wanted to correct. I've been, you, uh, Barry and everybody else, I've been saying it this way, um, build alternative worlds that are exactly counter to the imperatives of social control. That's wrong. I didn't mean social control. I meant resocial. Build alternative worlds that we can use as technologies of the self to resocialize ourselves, to become the kind of people who are equal to the challenges we face in the world today. That's how I say it. I don't know why I said social control. The point is, Resocializing ourselves, and that's not trivial. That is difficult as hell. Um, and here I find a line in, in your uh, in your article: um, uh, television broadcast from a single source to an audience of many. Decentralized storytelling networks are peer to peer. They emerge from the collective space of audience participation. I call that the audience nation. Nice. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I call the, okay, first of all, mass media, I call the broadcast, the culture. And, and it creates an audience nation. So you're saying the same thing I am with different words, peer to peer, right? Participation is the opposite of what I call the audience nation. And so thank you for reminding me of this wonderful phrase, peer to peer. I'm gonna use it. <laughs> um, 
And then you say, decentralized storytelling requires navigating your human experience within a story space. The architects of the story space were your ancestors. Now, folks, she's telling this beautiful story about her Native American way of being in the world uh, through stories. I'm, that's kind of the opposite of me. I'm trying to ask the question, how do we build a world for the future? Now, I'm not saying you're not, but I, I understand the way you approach it. It's, it's very much about ancestry, past, tradition, that sort of thing. That's cool. And how to maintain that. Um, right. I don't know what I have to say about that. That's great. Uh, yeah, the difference between us is that you are mostly past-oriented, but not totally. You're talking about the future, bringing that into the future, those traditions. And I'm pretty much totally future oriented because I have nothing kind to say about the past of the broadcast. Okay. Well, maybe, let, Gene, let me back up a second. Um, ask Amelia to uh, comment on some of this stuff. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about that ties together um, your secession from the broadcast and this notion of decentralization is sort of <clears throat> um, extremely germane to the times in which we're living in that um, we had this um, sort of web collapse to these broadcast channels on things like Facebook. And now we have this moment where our communication platforms have sort of broken apart again into lots of different smaller rooms and channels like you know Zoom that we're on, um, but also a lot of these video game communities and worlds. Um, so maybe, uh, I mean, Amelia, do, do you have anything just to add to the, um, in terms of the uh, um, synopsis of your article and how it connects with this uh, sort of secession from the broadcast concept? Sure. I mean, I guess I'll continue on from what um, Jean just brought up there. You know, in, in the Haudenosaunee culture, we have this concept of seven generations. So my current present is a communication with seven generations behind me. And it's also in communication with the seven generations yet to be. And so that the time space continuum is, is connected to the present moment. I'm constantly in conversation both with the past and with my future ancestors. So when we have this concept of ancestors. It's really not the appropriate word in English because ancestors obviously is like an antecedent. It's something from behind. When we think of ancestors really as kindred, ki you know, family, and that is both from behind and in front of me. And anything that I do now is both in relationship and because of what has happened in the past. And it also is manifesting in the future. And that is all happening in the singular moment. So what we, so we have a slightly different way of thinking of it as rather I would never say that I'm someone who thinks about the past or the future more because those would be two concepts that would be outside of the way in which I understand the mind space of, of my own life and my own experience in the world. Um, and I'm so like excited about virtual reality and augmented reality and, you know, cyberspace or whatever you want to call like the way in which we have present community mediated through digital systems because it creates a co-dream space where we are able to dream with each other collectively. And I, I use the word dream space because it's a way, it's a space where I can uh, eat without eating, touch without touching, move without moving, and I can do it with other people. And I think that's really um, incredible. And I think that for me is more close to the experience that I would say is that experience of being and becoming both with my ancestors in the past and the future, where I can maybe do that with my ancestors, but can I do it with my neighbors? And in this new uh, way of decentralized storytelling, I believe that we can. I believe we can co-build these kind of dream spaces where we can move without moving and talk without talking. And I think that's really cool. I think it's super cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I totally, that's my interest in it as well. Uh, uh, and yes, your explanation of past, present, future is very interesting. I totally understand that. It presents a problem to me because uh, I have so little interest in the past of what I call the broadcast, that is, 
Western capitalist industrial civilization and the whole hustle way of life of being in the world that I just don't think I have a past. You know, it's just, that's not a past I want anything to do with. And it's the entire past of, of everything in, in white industrial culture, you know? So that's the difference. You have a richness of family history, whatever you want to call it, that I don't have. Maybe other people, uh, you know, middle class white people have it, but I don't. And uh, I've been thinking critically about it all my life. So this is, you're, you're telling me something very important. I need to acknowledge that. And uh, that's cool. Thank you very much. Um, and you said something. Yeah, I think we're both interested in this concept of how do we build these worlds that you were just talking about in the most compelling way that they have this great power to draw us in, you know, for us to be there. But that phrase, draw us in, is very, uh, got to be careful about that because, because that's what the broadcast does all the time. It's the most powerful drawing in force in the world. So yes, we want to be drawn into these worlds, but not the way the broadcast does it. And you say here, decentralized storytelling requires navigating your human experience within a story space. And that's saying it right, I think. You know, that's not, you know, that's not what the people who write, write movies for streaming and all that, that's a, they're not asking themselves that. They have a whole other set of questions, uh, but goals and so on. <clears throat> um, I got, I want, I, I have this thing I want to read. Uh, no, that's not it. Go away. Um, maybe it's here. And maybe I'm not reading it at the right time here. But I'm going to read it anyway. And maybe it's relevant to now, but it certainly will be relevant to something that's coming up. <clears throat> Okay, this is just uh, two paragraphs, well, <laughs> three, uh, but you might like it. Like all cultures, the broadcast is a technology of the self. And I get that from Michel Foucault. Everything we think, feel, desire, and do, or don't do, results from our living in it. We are who we are, and therefore civilization is what it is because we internalize those understandings and agreements. We become the place we live in. We are not only born in the world. The world is also born in us. We are made of molecules, but we're also made of stories. And you make a big deal about stories in here, and, and we all should. I mean, stories are, are the thing, you know? And then I just wanna go a little on here. <clears throat> and um, this will be out of context, but. I agree. That's the last piece. The socialization the culture administers through the broadcast cultural hegemony. Its imperial speech is univocal. Many channels, one voice. Many voices, one chorus. Many stories, one message. Many views of the world, one worldview. We suffocate in the broadcast oppressive univocality. We feel claustrophobic in its words. Only one pur purpose exists there and it's not ours. All the wisdom of history tells us that wherever one voice speaks, wherever one story is told is not a healthy place to be. But it's not only the broadcast univocality that's so important for social control. It's, all the rep it's also the repetition of its stories, the essential repetition that stabilizes the culture genre, right? Repetition normalizes. It solidifies belief. What is repeated becomes truth. What is not repeated recedes from consciousness. So the stories of any culture must be told over and over again, never stopping. The chorus must repeat without end, over and over again, endless and immersive repetition. We live in oceans of redundancy. So that's coming from this book I'm writing. And I think that when down below in your article, we're gonna to get to something that addresses well, that. Let me ask a little question about that and yeah. really see what you think. Um, what, you know, when we have these decentralized stories going on, 
Um, I guess ultimately my question is when you get back to things that require a cohesive societal kind of coordinated response, and let's take something like climate change or this COVID situation, um, where you need some sort of unified story, uh, societal control, let's say, in, in some way. Um, if you don't have this sort of centralized broadcast and are in all of these little decentralized uh, narrative spaces, um, how do we work out uh, bringing people together in that way for things that require these like sort of fuller style design science systemic approaches to these global planetary problems? Well, I have a response, but I'd like, maybe Amelia has thought on that. Um, yeah, I guess I would I would challenge that. I would say that I don't think that we have any proof that I can like I don't know that I I can think of right now as to when um, like a singular broadcast that was unified maybe in its propaganda actually has unified people in a meaningful way. Um, it would unify some people in some way. Uh, I think we have like extreme oppression and uh, in this country, and so I I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to see when there was maybe like a imperative for a war or a pandemic in which the most vulnerable of our population have been uh, both protected and um, helped, right? And so if it was in order for us to gather together as a society in order to do something for welfare, if those who are the most vulnerable among us are not well, then it is not for the community. Absolutely. Uh, in media studies, it's, it's pointed out continuously over hundreds of books that this, uh, you know, this ostensibly unifying thing of the big voice that we all hear is actually separates us, you know, and that's why I call it the audience nation. And that kind of a uh, um, socialization happens, we internalize it, we do it within ourselves, and we're not aware that that we're doing that. So it feels normal, it feels natural, but it's not. Well, I mean, it is a natural response to this thing I call the broadcast, which ultimately does separate us. You know, it's the voice that stands between all of us. And so what you said, I totally agree. But Barry, um, this brings up another thing I've been thinking about recently. My whole life has been thinking about, you know, the, the communication revolution that was going to bring us all together. Well, and for sure, the, the myth was that, that even if we're not together, you're talking about 200 nations around the world and look at the state of the world today, and all of a sudden we're gonna come together like brothers and sisters and the world would be fabulous. And we said, well, maybe not, but for sure we'll come together in times of crisis. Is that happening? I don't think it is, I don't think it's going to. And to me, that's the apocalypse, not this virus. I'm beginning to see that my whole life's dream <laughs> My naive dream looks to be like it's not going to happen right now. I'm not predicting anything in the future, but right now, if you take a cold look at what's happening, there is more uh, distance between people now than, than before, I think. And it appears that way to me. There's more uh, polarization, this whole thing about polarization and all that stuff, and here it is. And sometimes I say, well, yeah, you know, I said before here on this, this book club, we gotta go through this, gotta go through this. This is to be expected, you know, this is the only way we know how to deal with something like this. Well, <laughs> go through it, <laughs> what does that mean? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, uh, and if that big test, again, if that big test of the ability of, of internetworking and connection if that big test is a threat to all of us, it's gonna bring us together. Well, it's not happening yet. And so Barry, I think that's what you were trying to get yeah, at. I mean, I, and I, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but I, I think one of the um, 
things about not having uh, one of the big problems now is you don't want to know where to find fact, right? You have people living in different media spheres and it's not decentralized, but you do have, you know, take in the U S you have at least two major by political party media environments that the population's living in. And so in one sense, you could argue that that's a reason for a lot of the polarization and you don't, there's no unified cohesive reality that everybody is, has as a worldview. And so you get polarization because you literally have a population living in two different media spheres. Um, and so I guess my question would be, um, how does, further pushing that into an extreme of, you know, a billion different media spheres um, address that issue? Well, I, if I understand your question, I have no idea. I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm seriously, I'm seriously, and I think I'm not the only one. I think millions of us, right, in this country, at least, are shocked at the revelation that's happening in front of us of this polarization and the number of people who, from our point of view, are really living in a fantasy, a serious mm -hmm. damaging fantasy. They're probably saying that about us. I have no idea. But you know, for me, and I can only say, I think I know the truth when I see it, you know? I mean, I'm kind of aware of the world and its history and I have kind of intuition of what what is most likely to be true and what is most likely not to be true. I think any normal person kind of has that balance, you know? And that's why I'm so shocked that there are, in, from my point of view, so many not normal people who seem to be not, be not able to make the distinction between what is true and false. I, I, have, I don't have words to even describe it. I'm astounded at this. So, you, so I would say, well, you might ask me, well, where do you get this truth? And I would say, starting out, it's on the left, right? Why on the left? Because the left is, is if you're going to find any force that's against the status quo, it's on the left. You know, I mean, where else would you find it? In general. So I'm just, uh, that's all, I just, uh, frankly, it just, I'm out, I can't even grasp this thing about uh, polarization and, and then when I, and then when we read about the extreme extreme beliefs of a lot of people, I'm just bowled over. I, I, this comes from Mars. I have zero idea, but it's scary. Well, I think you know. I think a lot about the practice of empathy, and it it really does require us to listen um, to other people. And it's very difficult to listen to other people when we're just sort of signaling and virtue sig signaling languages that are kind of crossing each other on the internet, shouting into these spaces where, you know, we need algorithms that are selecting us for the most outrageous thing we say. Like if I say something that might be more true to how I feel, but is less sensational, that, that tweet or that like sort of yell into the canyon is not going to be, you know, amplified as much as something that is, um, you know, really polarizing, right? Because those things that people react to is what is, you know, what these milli, you know, millisecond uh, algorithms are sampling for. And so I think a lot about that practice of empathy that it really requires me. And I, I decided like on the eve of, you know, 2016 election that I would start listening to people in person and, and saying that like that or one-to-one -one communication is going to be how I understand truth rather than how I'm sampling through, um, you know, through social media or, e you know, even if someone I know in person, like I've, I've recently, I was in a, a chat group with a bunch of very old friends and someone said, yeah, it's really sad. I had to stop in a lot of these online communities I was a part of because people kept saying these like very extreme things that I disagreed with. And I started thinking to myself, like, we have to really prioritize people that we know in, in person and people that we've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with, even if they say a lot of bullshit in a chat room somewhere, because we have to say that like we are, are trying to engage in a certain way online. And we're all kind of like, like you mentioned, we're new to this, we're infants to this, we're figuring out this way. And we've been taught because we are feeding algorithms and they are feeding us back how we are important. We've been taught to kind of say more polarizing things in order to be heard. And that's what we want as humans. We want to be heard. We want people to empathize with us. And we want to feel connected and feel community. And if we just deprioritize that, we say, 
just because I have, you know, social media metrics, um, that is not as important as if, if I sit with my friends and I, I say things and they say, I, I don't really agree with that. I should actually care more about that, those connections, those direct connections, than I should care about about how many retweets I get on a, like a crazy thing that I wanted to say, um, that should center me more. And I think that's what we're doing. We're pushing further and further out with these um, social media outlets in order to feel pushback. We need pushback in order to feel like we are a part of a community, either whether it's negative or positive, anything, anything but being alone, anything but being ignored, anything but being not important. We want anything that gives us back because maybe we're not finding it in our our face-to-face -face communication and we have to build empathy by listening and i think that that is something that you know I, I even want the left to do as well i want them to listen more to people who have different opinions than them who have different experiences from them who are in different states than them because i think when we can have that direct communication we can begin to understand where people are coming from why people are coming from um, I just think it's really important. And I, I've been trying to do that more and more um, so that I can hack those algorithms myself with my own brain, with my own actions, if that makes sense. I like that phrase, hack those algorithms. Uh, I totally, uh, uh, I want to say not totally, <laughs> you're bringing up empathy and you know the, the basic essence of what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, maybe I, should, I don't belong in this conversation because I, ne I don't know what social media is. I, I wouldn't be there. Ouch. I wouldn't be there if I was to die tomorrow. I, I just, it's the worst thing I can imagine. I realize I'm insulting everyone who's there, but that's, that's who I am. So on one level, I feel like, who am I to talk about this? I wouldn't dare be in a space where algorithms do what you said. I simply would not do that to myself. I respect myself more than that. It's like the broadcast. And that's another reason I don't do social media. That word social social society that's society society is the broadcast we carry the culture with us we are the conduits of the culture so if i think i'm going to go on something called social media what do you think i expect the broadcast conduits of the culture totally i'm just not going to do that and uh, another point there i study so, uh, you know social control a lot uh, one aspect of social control is to keep an open mind. Keep an open mind. That means you can be steered this way or that way because your mind is perpetually endlessly open. And I'm saying close the mind, but close it as an intel. Close it when you think you've fairly studied life and people you know i'm 77 years old you know you got to reach a point in your life where you think hey, hey i got it you know i understand this i've talked to enough people i know what these people think i'm more or less, i said earlier i don't know well I, you know i can't it's, i'm shocked well not really what i'm shocked at is the number of them the, the views expressed are so banal i can't even get into it but it's the number of them the damage that, from my point of view, let me say what, one other way of saying this. When talking about a communication revolution, one of the ways of saying it is that you go from representation to presentation, right? You go from being represented by this centralized one-way broadcast to presenting ourselves from mass communication to group conversation. Totally. Well, we've done that, right? It's, it's, we, were, we are presenting ourselves and what do we see? a severely damaged population. There's no other way to say it. Now, what does that tell us? Well, one, one thing it tells me, I don't, I'm not gonna hang around with what I call damaged people. Then you, you say, well, have some empathy. I think for me, that is empathy. If I think someone's hurt, I gotta tell them, you know? And uh, if they wanna argue with me, I'm not sure I would, I, I don't know about that. It just, because I've thought about this all my life and I've come to some conclusion and coming to a conclusion is not a good thing for centralized control. You know, again, you got to keep an open mind. You're not supposed to be so cool. Well, up to a point. There's a, there's a, I think a difference between being flexible and, um, and being able to break, 
And I once had a great professor, uh, William Lundberg, who said, uh, the moment you become inflexible is when you become old. He's like, I want to be able to expand my understanding of things and I don't want things to be able to break my understanding. And I, I really, I really, that resonated a lot with me. Um, you know, not just because he was a video artist and kind of was, you know, able to really understand, you know, or, or just appreciate sort of all the different types of weird technologies that his students were using, but um, but just because I I felt I felt that when we said things that I could tell were really different than what he could believe, rather than having it break his understanding, which would maybe discredit us or 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 just yeah, it could become boring, right? That can become boring. Um, it's interesting to become flexible, to stay, uh, you know, to move with the wind, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with everything you're saying. I'm only saying that there comes a point where enough is enough, you know? If you say that you should never come to a point where enough is enough. Oh, I mean, you know, like I'm obviously a reasonable person and I think those communicating those those boundaries are really important. I will talk to people I disagree with about things and it's it's very important for me to say okay, I'm I'm done now. I don't have anything to add to this conversation and I feel overwhelmed and I would like to maybe not talk with you anymore or or to keep going. I'm not I'm not someone who even enjoys playing devil's advocate. Like I like to listen um, to people's experience and try to find where there is a connection. And if I find a connection, that's great. And if I don't, um, I get overwhelmed easily too. So I'm, I'm the first person that will kind of raise up and say like, I think you'll find a better community somewhere else than with me. And that's yeah. not, not everyone should be my friend or in my community. I'm not, that would yeah. be, that would be a, a, a very like unenforceable thing, right? Um, yeah. Yes, I, I understand and agree. Uh, Please understand that in, in this in our exchange here, I'm really not talking about you personally. Oh you no, know? of course, no, of course. Yeah. I always say myself. That, that's like the activist in me is that I always use myself as the example um, because I think that's a practice in empathy. So even though I know that, I always that's just kind of my rhetorical approach is that I always use myself as example. Just okay. Like, yeah. Okay. I understand. I just wanted to make sure you understood. I'm talking about the the broadcast. And um, that's where I apply this notion of the enough is enough. And, and you know, enough flexibility, enough doesn't that, because I know that I'm being manip manipulated every nanosecond of my life. And there are, and, and serious thought has gone into by very serious, but what I call evil people and how to do that. They spend their whole life figuring out how to steer this thing. And so that, you know, and I also wonder too, like I, I, I sometimes wonder if we know what we're doing, which I, I kind of would imagine the answer is no, that we don't know what we're doing when it comes to the way in which we algorithmically separate people in our broadcast social media spheres. And it's almost like it's a mind control that we are not in control of, right? <laughs> right? Um, and so, and I, so I wonder how that's kind of chipping away at the w ways in which we have um, perception of community and storytelling. Um, and I don't, I, I almost wish it was some very large coordinated uh, conspiracy. And yet I think it almost isn't. I think it's something that is emerging as a, a mind control of like perception. And I don't think anyone could stop it or could pull the strings on it. Like, I think it has, uh, I think we've opened a bit of the Pandora's box with that. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's a very, very complicated subject. Uh, I don't know. I'm self-educated, still am, and it's a matter of intuition for me. If I think I, there's an area that I don't feel like I understand enough, I go for it. And this conversation with you is, I'm feeling that. You're helping me. You're giving me other ways to think about it. So I'm always open to that. There comes a time though, when my intuition just says to me, you've had enough, you, you've got this, and any more discussion of this is just a waste of your time. You know, I, that's, that, that's who I am, I just can't, you know, 
that's it. I think that's something that each of us needs to get deeply in touch with is our own intuition. Like when you know that you know, then you should be allowed to know that, right? Right, right. And then, but however, there, there's other people who also know that they know, you sure. know. Sure. Yeah. And, but it's still encouraging them to connect, you know, deeply with their own intuition rather than relying on external uh, signals to say when something is true. I mean, that's kind of like that gaslighting concept, right? Like if, yeah. if you don't allow people to, to really truly depend on their own intuition, then they become very easily manipulated, manipulated and that's dangerous, right? Right. Mm. Intuition has a lot to do with critical thinking, which is forbidden in general in any society on this planet. You know, you cannot have the majority of any population thinking critically, and that's going to affect your intuition profoundly. So I just don't know. You know, you get to a point with this. It's uh, I, that's why it's so extremely interesting. It's just so, uh, in a sense, undecidable in a way. You know, and uh, you say a lot about that in your article. Uh, I think. Could I go down and, and of course, of course. something else? Uh, uh, let's see. Hold on. Oh, here's a phrase you use. I really like this as a writer. You say, uh, of course, these stories still fall under the jurisdiction of their corporate custodians. I love that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> that's beautiful. You know, I'm really, I'm very grateful for any kind of language which ex expands my way of jumping on these people. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, then you say, are you talking about this fellow, uh, Andrew Hussey, Huss? Andrew Hussey, yeah. Hussey, uh, and uh, so on. <clears throat> and talking about the, um, this thing called Homestruck, I guess, Homestruck. Homestruck. Yeah, anyone out in the chat know Homestruck? <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and you say, um, he draws characters in a rudimentary fashion. This made it easy for fans to replicate the characters on their own computers. And then a few sentences down, uh, with, the, with its multiverses and alternative timelines, the material that fans generate can be, and here's what I highlighted, incorporated back into the canon, even, uh, 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 there's a parenthesis there that I don't understand, can, can be incorporated back into the canon. It promotes radical inclusivity on every level. Fans don't feel like they need permission to enter into it and interact. Uh, that st stood out for me for one thing. What do you mean by the canon? What is the canon? Well, he uses, and, and you know, I think that the, these phrases are used a lot in fandom communities and uh, fan fiction communities. So rather than talking about like the historical Western canon of, you know, philosophy or literature, I'm actually using fan language here, where in these fandom communities, they have you know, maybe a little bit before Andrew Hussey's time, you've had a story like Star Wars, and then people have created fan fiction and fan fiction environments and MUDs and, uh, you know, D&D &D campaigns or any kind of way in which they can take that same world and then build other stories in that same world space. And those would be considered fan fiction um, or fan generated content or, and, and it wasn't um, sanctioned as being part of canon, right? And people would talk about this a lot, like, okay, yeah, in XYZ mud that was fan created, this character did that, but that's not canon, they would say, that's not canon, right? That to, as a way of distinguishing between something that's established or generally accepted by a fan community and then something that's extra, that's like atomized po portions of that fan community. But what Andrew Hussey did with Homestuck, which is interesting, is he said, no, the chats that the fans have, the fan art that they create, the, the side fanfic stories that they make, that is canon. It is all canon. I've, I've maybe set um, the world building in motion, but he thinks of himself now more as a, 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 like a custodian and a curator of it rather than, um, than the, the singular author of it. Uh-huh. Interesting. We're getting so, up on about an hour here. So I, there's a couple of questions from audience here that I kind of want to bring up. And I haven't done this webinar thing or not, but there's a question from Rachel Guma here. Um, 
let me see if I can, there's a button that says answer live. Maybe she. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm up here. I don't know. Me tab. Um, great. Um, oh, there she is. Um, Hello. <laughs> Great, so you can ask your own question. Right. Okay, cool. Awesome. So um, I've been following the reading and everything and I'm I'm really excited to, to hear it from the mouth, you know? Um, but I was wondering what Jean and Amelia thought about the quote on page 133, which really resonated with me as a filmmaker. Personal cinema becomes art when it moves beyond self-expression to encompass life expression. And I was just wondering if maybe you had thoughts about this now and how, we could, you know, how we could move beyond um, just thinking of expanding on that. Do you want me to answer? Both of you. <laughs> well, I'll give mine first since I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was only again trying to attack the narrow control oriented uh, existence of mass culture. Mm -hmm. The difference between art and not art. And yeah. that thing of expressing wh whatever you just said, uh, you know, expressing something larger, that's poetry, you know? That's the whole purpose of art. And that's all I was trying to say. I was just bitching <laughs> about, uh, about commercial culture, the broadcast. Right. Yeah. And, I, and in, the, in, the, in the context of that book, there were these new film styles, if you will, or techniques that in the films I pointed out there seemed to me to have a cinematic language that was reaching more closely to that large spiritual, all affecting domain that we, where we find our greatest human fulfillment. That's right. all I was trying to say there. Cool. Sounds good. <laughs> and, and how and how the broadcast is against that. You yeah. just can't have people going around feeling that way in mass. It's just a, it's not the kind of people you can control very well. That's right. what Amelia, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean I, I really liked that quote as well. And um, I think a lot about self-expression and life expression as an artist. Um, where I think of there's things that I do that I express that are for myself and they're not for a public audience. And they're important, but I don't consider them art. And I, I would agree with Jean that they wouldn't be art, but they're still important for me to express. There may be ways of um, thinking about life, mapping life. If you're an artist, uh, you take notes through art, right? Like you process through art. You, um, But those processes and those notes, that's not the art, but it's an important, you know, uh, process right but when when you're expressing art it it has to include the concept of um the community and the audience and the mm -hmm. world and the existence otherwise it's again it's like it's a notation or it's uh it's still in process i would say it's not it's not it hasn't um emerged wow i like that thank you i like it too <laughs> uh, let's do another one here with uh Unmute Gustavo. He had about 16 billion questions. And so I'm going to make him pick one, which can be whichever one he wants. Hi, Gustavo. Uh, sorry about that. No, no keep I, him coming. I know, I know. I was inspired. Uh, Gene, thank you very much. This chapter was very enlightening. I think the core question to me is the the links between art, technology, science, and our human evolution. Uh, and I think that uh, you had a vision of how we can evolve 50 years ago. And I love Amelia's understanding of how we see time, seven generations in the past and the future. How can a new vision of this technology evolve beyond politics? That would be my question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big questions. <clears throat> uh, uh, it, uh, because it seems like what we're talking about is how do we organize society 
it's an organization of capitalism is organizing society. So what is beyond capitalism? Is it information? Is it the algorithm? What is it? Socialism, anarchism. <laughs> I, hey, I'm not joking. I'm an anarchist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what an anarchist is? I'll bet you anything. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk this way. No, it's good. I want to hear most, it. Most people in this country, if you say anarchism, they would say, no rules. My God, no rules. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what anarchism is. It's no rulers. And in a capitalist hierarchical society, everyone, most of the society must understand anarchism, which is the exact opposite of what we got. They must, and they must understand that as chaos. Just go read any... Oh, hell. I got a couple of books I could show you. It's exactly opposite of what mo most people think. So, so, I, so that's my answer to your question. But uh, um, you said beyond politics. Well, that's very political. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Expanded Cinema 50 was got a review forum. Now we expect certain kind of viewpoints, certain attitude from Art Forum, right? And a lot of my friends thought that they were coming down on me and making fun of me. And, you know, the, the, the title was Cosmic Consciousness, you know, and, and, and Jane said, oh, wow, they're getting down on you and all that stuff. And I kind of thought, well, I kind of agree with them. If they're laughing at cos Cosmic Consciousness, I'll laugh with them, you know. But the one thing that, uh, I, that they did say that I would object to, they make fun of me saying um, that what, what has to be done is something beyond mere politics, mere politics. And I'll stand by that to my dying day, you know, but they didn't, they, and I, you know, I forget it, forget it for them. I love them, but you know, anyway, oh, I, what I'm trying to say to your question, Gustavo, is, isn't it true? I mean, do any of us disagree that the real, serious, profound transformations in human evolution have been beyond politics? I mean, they have. Yeah. They, come, they do not come from anywhere else. They come from the poets, come from the, come from the nurses. Teacher. Oh, 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 Amelia, I just, can you also talk about your concept of time and its relation to nature? It seems no. as though, it seems no, as though, I can't. I have no concept of that. I think Amelia probably has, has better than me. Well, I, Yes, I, Amelia. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a lot about, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm asked to speak a lot about the concept of ancestral AI because I'm very interested in AI and I've done, you know, I've had a lot of research labs in AI and large projects, um, research projects in that space, both academic and, and in, in the corporate world. But um, I, I think that where we can have a, impact is if we redesign our systems so that we're planning for um, slow and long spaces. Right now, our AI is so dependent upon data lakes of information that only would be, um, I guess, uh, lucrative if they were within financial systems or within corporate systems or within surveillance systems. And if we could imagine that we can build AI to be something that is um, the repository of ancestral information in the way that I think of ancestors as being both in the past and the future at the same time. And I think it's possible. And I like having these conversations with technologists to try to imagine how we can design for that. Right now, the problems that we can solve with the, with the AI structures that we have, with the machine learning algorithms that we have, are so dependent upon the types of data lakes that we have available to us. And the type of information there, again, is, is only really through financial, uh, commercial, and uh, surveillance. And that's, we're not gonna ever get to any really interesting places if that's the only things that we're allowing our machine learning um, algorithms to talk to us with. Of course, there's an amazing, uh, AI artists and creatives that are doing really amazing and, and fun things with the, with GANs and with images and with animation, and yet still a lot of the funding that's there is um, is still predominantly in the, in the world of surveillance. So I would I would just like to challenge us to say that we we have we have and we are always continuing to invent um, really beautiful things with technology. But if we are basing all of the data sets just in those three areas, I think we're really limiting um, how much beautiful impact we could have in, in our world. 
I uh, want to say you're saying something extremely profound there. I want everybody to think about this for a minute. AI is a Promethean technology who's on top of AI is on top of the world, more or less. And the, this issue of social control, which has obsessed me all my life, man, this is, this is a nexus right here. Who get, as you were saying, uh, the, 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 uh, w the way you worded it, the way we build AI, the intelligence that AI has to work with depends entirely who's controlling that. And this is, this is, there's, I think maybe there's almost nothing more important than to uh, release AI from the dominators, you know, from that kind of consciousness, we're screwed. I mean, you get this broadcast con consciousness and that's how you define AI? I don't want to see that world. No. Amelia? Amelia? Yeah. Do, do, you, do you happen to have any ideas to answer Jean's question? How do we release AI from the dominators? Well, is it, a, I, is it mean, a new economic model? It could be a new economic model. I mean, I think right now we, we, I have a lot of, you know, a lot of machine learning is, is really just based on, uh, it is all based on pa the past, even if it's just the past information in the last five milliseconds, it's still always um, very backward thinking. And so it's making projections and decisions about something that's happened in the past. And it has to be something that we um, can quantify in specific ways that then connect, can connect with those Jupyter notebooks or however we're, we're, we're building our machine learning algorithms. And so just there just stopping for a minute and saying to ourselves what data is not here and why is the very first question that i think anyone who's a machine learning scientist or, or on um projects needs to ask themselves like what information is here but more importantly what information is not here and why um and then you know, we, we have so much information out there around cultural bias um, that is happening with AI and, and our, our ability to take very rudimentary mentary, uh, machine learning algorithms and already turn them into things that we can use in our society for, for policing and imprisoning our, our members of our society. And again, I think it's important for us to ask what things are we choosing to allow um, computers, AI, machine learning to do so that humans will not do them? And why would we make those decisions? Why would we decide that we want a machine or an operational system to decide if someone should be in prison or not, rather than a human being? And that's really a political decision that we can make. We can decide that there's areas in which it's inappropriate for a machine learning to exist, and there are areas in which it's highly appropriate. Sensors on um, the MTA or the BART system, that's a great use of machine learning, right? Sensors across the country that are working with um, public transportation to make sure that it's maintaining you know, safe distances between cars or making sure that they are safe for people to use. Those are great uses of machine learning. Uh, predictive policing is a horrible one, right? That's a horrible use of that. But we haven't been able to have those conversations as citizens of saying just where is there a sign that says do not touch when it comes to automated systems, especially knowing how completely biased and very rudimentary they are at this point. And I guess that's one of my questions about the, the, the broadcast in general is how do you have a conversation without about this stuff? It depends on what sort of circle you define around citizens, but let's just say a national level, you know, um, downfall of the nation state aside, like how do you have a unified conversation about this stuff that makes sense when you have these sort of decentralized isn't the right word in this case, but separated which is true of maybe both cases, media spheres, where you just have these different, you know, how can anybody connect when the information coming in is, is so separate? Well, I mean, you know, it, 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 a lot of it does fall on our shoulders. And I say our meaning people that work with technology and that shape conversations around media. I think a lot of it does fall on us and this community and our listeners and those of us who are sitting here today. Um, because we are the ones that build things and we are the ones that, that are close to these conversations, it is important for us to first ask those questions and to model that behavior and to, and to 
to do the work that we need to do to continue to speak out and to inform and educate people and to make sure that we use language that's accessible and that we use um, concepts that, that we can explain what we mean without, um, you know, a lot of bullshit, right? Like we can get to the heart of these matters and talk about the issues um, and phrase them um, as to how it will impact those who are most vulnerable in our community rather than just lofty ideals. And I think that's really important to bring, bringing it to that. I feel like that's my responsibility as someone who works with machine learning is to do that, is to educate people, but also make sure I always bring it back to how can this um, hurt or harm those who are most vulnerable in our, in our communities. I'd like to uh, uh, quote something from your article. Yeah. Uh, she has this, uh, she has her text and then she has a photo. And this photo is from big thing hanging on a wall somewhere. If it's inaccessible to the poor, it's neither radical nor revolutionary. Right on. Power of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Barry, uh, before we close, I'm not saying we are closing, but I have something very important to say that has nothing to do with this particular conversation. So before we close yeah, today, go ahead. Well, are we closing? I don't know. You want to do it right before we close? Okay. Uh, well, actually, let me, there's one more question in here. Let's get, at, well, maybe a couple to get asked, but um, one question from someone anonymous asks about, there There's uh, was a quote in the book where you say the logic of cybernetic age into which we're moving is, will be both and, I think, as opposed to either or. Uh, which is in physics called triadic logic. Um, and they just ask if you feel differently about that now or if it applies or if you have any thoughts. <laughs> Better have a thought. Yeah, uh, well, or not. Uh, maybe, <laughs> you know. Well, no, I mean, given this conversation today, you know, with Amelia, what she was saying about empathy and open mind, all that stuff, maybe both and thinking is uh, in order. These days, maybe that's what maybe that's one way to one trope or metaphor that we could think that way about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if people, you know, again, these people say, "Wow, this uh, expanded cinema was so visionary and all that." Well, you know, I don't want to insult them and say they're wrong, <laughs> but kind of puts you in a kind of puts you in an embarrassing yeah, right. situation. But. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, <laughs> if you, if you want to follow that track and interpret that both and statement, bring it to today. Yeah, I think we're there, aren't we? I mean, it's, that's, that's the dilemma, the political and social dilemma Was there, that, um, that, that is right in our face big time right now. I remember something from our email change that we wanted to say something again about Jaron. Is that still true or no? You know, I... I I didn't have time to look up. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's in, two things about, I mean, I don't want to go back on him for too long, but there are sort of two interesting things to, to add to that conversation, I think from last week, which is one is one of his books is called, I think, 10 Reasons to Delete Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, which is, so he's definitely on the same page with us in, term, in certain terms of the broadcast of, of social media. Um, but the other, again, is this idea from a talk he gave at Gray Area Festival last year um, about AI versus VR. And I don't know if this, I'm just going to throw this out here and maybe it spurs some thoughts. But the basic crux of the conversation was that VR um, presupposes a human in the, in the whole reason for the, for the subject existing you know you have this multi-sensory environment for who for people um, whereas machine learning and ai doesn't presuppose a person at all in that conversation and so in terms of um the two big technological research subjects going on right now it's sort of clear um which one is more about humanity and which one isn't well i follow that to a certain degree and I, but why does AI not presuppose a human? I mean, we've just been talking about the political implications of, right? Haven't we just been talking about the politics of AI? Mm -hmm. Now, they do talk about that point, I don't know what they would call it, where, where AI sort of goes off on its own, you know, and it doesn't need people anymore. <clears throat> I don't think that's science fiction. I think it probably will happen. But uh, 
I would take issue with Jaron on that level. Nothing is apart from humans on this planet in some way or another. That would be my response. Yeah, I would agree with that, especially since, um, you know, I don't believe that humans are separated from nature and I don't believe humans are different than animals and that we're all, you know, the natural world and the human world are connected and deeply so. And so I would agree that what humans create and at the end of the day, humans are creating AI and machine learning. And yes, there may come a time when they're autonomous from us, but we have created them. Um, We have put this into motion and we are part of the natural world and are still subject to um, to it as we Feel very vulnerable right now actually from feeling very vulnerable to the natural world We're all you know sheltering in our in our apartments because we have um, We have toyed with nature in a particular way and we are you know suffering Um, so you know, I, I feel like I, I do get disheartened when there is an amplification around the rhetoric of machine learning and AI, um, that it's A, already here, it's already autonomous, and B, that it's already thinking and, and being completely autonomous from it, and and C, that we should then worship and, and, and think that it's decisions that it, that it makes are somehow more true than human truth, that are more true than natural truth. And, and I think that we have to ask ourselves who benefits from that. Right on. Yeah. Always, always ask that question. Every minute of your life, who benefits in a, in a hierarchical world? Um, and absolutely. Um, and I think we just want more here for Gene, which is going to be an easy one. Um, how can we access George Kuchar's video diaries? <laughs> Well, they're distributed by the, uh, the video data bank in Chicago. That's where you get them. And so uh, there you go. that's where you get them. They, they of course, charge uh, institutional rents. I mean, they're not cheap. You, you, I, I couldn't afford to rent them at the prices they charge. But we've got them all. All right. I think that's about... Yeah, well, I can't wait with this webinar. Can we get everybody else on the listening uh, unmuted? I don't know how we do that on this. We've changed the technology a little, but I think it's a good time for anybody still on to uh, show their appreciation for Gene for sticking with this arduous, although <laughs> exciting process. Here we go. Now we're getting some community. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and chatting yeah, with you. Thanks, Amelia. Had a wonderful time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia. I really, uh, I learned from you. Likewise, likewise. You know, I taught your book in my first video art class that I taught at Vanderbilt when I was 25. <laughs> so oh. it meant a lot to me. Glad to be of service. Thank you. All right, everybody wave bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Well. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. You are welcome. Thank you for being there. Bye-bye.